They hear me? Okay. All right. So when um, I was asked to do this talk, I, I've done a couple of talks like this and looking at like my top 10 articles um, for the emergency department or for trauma or what have you. And when they told me that I had 25 minutes, I said, I can't do 10. I, we're going to do five. So then I went to the physicians I work with and said, hey, can you give me some topics of what you want to do? So of course, um, I have to make sure that every one of these topics has someone that it gets linked to. I'm sorry, Dr. Vale, but I, I really want to give you one, but I, I'm not really sure which one I want to give you. So um, that's the only disclosures that I have. They have not given me any financial relationships. I, I think maybe I need to have some. And so if you can talk to Dr. Vale and Dr. Hu um, to help me with that, we'll do really well. This is Dr. Hu's topic. Um, I went to him, I said, <laughs> he's going, oh God, no. I went to him and I said, hey, um, you know, I, I need something that's going to be a little bit more fun. Um, I have one. You know, it's not kind of fitting in here. And so Charles said to me, well, why don't you look at the chewing gum with ileuses? And, you know, I thought, you know, that is something that I do every single day. I walk up to um, the floor and I ask my patients, how was your night? How is your pain? And have you pooped? because I can't let half of these patients go home, as you know, that until they end up pooping. So this is why I decided to do this. So this was done, um, a study that was done out of the University of Bristol in um, England, and it really looked at post-op um, ileus and the causes of it and how it really relates to the recovery of our patients and how we can really decrease some of the length of stay for our patients. So we all know that the causes of ileus are manipulation of the bowels. You know, when the docs are in there kind of going like this, um, who knows what the heck they're doing with the bowels. I think it looks like that they're, you know, making sausages um, when they're doing what they're doing. The other thing is that, you know, the anesthetics that we're using. And then on top of that, we need to make sure that we're giving them pain medication. So with all those things that we've done, half our patients can't poop, and then I have to keep them there for longer periods of time, and then give them other little things like the Ducalax suppositories, the Max Citrate, the enemies, or whatever. And then I've made really good friends with the nurses that I'm working with. So um, according to this article, it says that gum chewing really is a way to kind of tease the brain, and it's called sham feeding. And it's what it's saying is that I'm kind of telling the brain that, you know, I'm really eating, and it's really thinking about um, encouraging some GI motility through my cephalic and vagal, vagal stimulation. So we all know that there's a lot of literature that's been extensively um, looked at, and what this, these authors looked at was um, couple different things. They looked at their search terms were gum chewing, chewing gum, ileus, and post-op pain, and they are post-operative. And what they came up with were six, really only six articles that fit this criteria. But then they wanted to narrow it down a little bit. And what they did was they looked at not only um, the post-op period, of, but they wanted to look at when they had flatus, when they were able to stool, and then the other piece was um, the length of stay, and then the, one of the articles lo really looked at clinical complications. So these are the nine articles that they looked at, and as you can see, they're pretty much all kind of colon resections um, when they were looking. They, these nine trials were all random controlled, and that was for our research nurse to make sure that she knew that I was doing the right things when I was looking through these. And um, they found that really the gum chewing was well tolerated and the complications were low. And this um, really kind of shows really some of the complications that you would find. And there really weren't anything really significant. There was a couple that talked about infections, and, um, but that's really the biggest things that you could find out of there. So overall, they found out that overall infection complications of any types were pretty low um, from this patient chewing gum. Flatus, well, that was the other thing they wanted. You know, that's the other thing I ask them, you know, are you passing gas? And it really, remember, you're looking at all these different articles. So one of the articles um, could have been 47 hours, and the next article could have been 69. So what they were looking at was there was this big time period between 47 hours and 69 hours in the chewing gum um, piece and 63 to 90 hours in the control group. Well, the combined results really um, showed a reduction by 14 hours um, in, this, in this patient population and was significant. 
Next one was passing stool, and this is really important to me so that I can get them out of the hospital. And they had a mean duration between 63 hours and 86 hours in the chewing gum um, group and 87 to 139 hours, which I thought was pretty good. They found significance in there and the time to bowel movement um, by 23 hours. So again, we improved a, this piece that we seem to think that, you know, is, you know, nothing very important, but really for some of these patients, that's a day in the hospital. So length of stay was my other thing that I looked at. And yes, it really did. They looked at four to 13 days in the control, or I mean in the chewing gum group and five to 14 days in the control group. And essentially they found that um, they were able to reduce it by 1.1 1 1 .1 days. The only outlier was the, um, this one group that was right here because their um, um, integral, um, their cordon, yeah, their, um, the little piece in here, I can't think of the word I want, um, really had a big group that was there, but they really weren't negative or positive to either one of these controls. So the conclusion is that in the immediate post-operative period, um, it helps to enhance movement by facilitating um, some GI motility um, and getting rid of this ileus that may or may um, happen. It's really inexpensive. It costs, what, 80 cents for a pack of, but you have to use sugarless gum. But 80 cents for a pack of sugarless gum, it's well tolerated by our patients and maybe we can get them out of the hospital a lot quicker. So my thought that is at every nurse's station that we put a pack of gum, sugarless gum, give it to our patients who are having problems pooping and we can get them out of the hospital a lot quicker. All right. Um, you know, we've talked about some of this already. We've looked at um, geriatrics and um, some of the geriatric protocols and really we're not really taking good care of our geriatric patients. So this um, protocol was done at um, St. A's up in Denver and um, they first decided that they needed a protocol and that was really or really kind of put together in around 2008, implemented in 2009 and um, in 2011 they decided that they really wanted to revise this a little bit more. But what they were looking at was um, venous lactate measures and the early trauma surgeon involvement and then risk mortality. So this um, article was out of the Journal of American um, Geriatrics, but the first piece to this was, um, was done and shown at um, the, Society of, the Journal for Society of Nursing Trauma. Um, Pam Borg um, was a big proponent of this, and then she's done a couple of presentations also for it. The overview was to investigate where the implementing uh, geriatric resuscitation protocol that used a lactated guided um, therapy with early treatment by the physician um, is associated with lower mortality through the early recognition of occult hypotension. And really, when I was listening to Dr. Moulton's um, lecture yesterday, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, can you believe that if we put these two technologies together, this protocol and that technology, wouldn't we be able to take care of our geriatric patients so much better? So I've given it to our, um, one of our other research nurses and to Dr. Hu, and I said, hey, we need to get this stuff so that we can try to look at um, some of, the, some of the, our geriatric patients. But really, what they thought, what they really looked at was, we really do a poor job of triaging our geriatric patients. They're under triage, um, and we really don't look at how bad off they are until they really plummet on us. The frequency is really underestimated by what they do physiologically. They have poor physiological reserves. And again, the other things that they come with are, they come with their comorbidities, and they come with that polypharmacy that we have to deal with. They also looked and found that there were really few resus criterias or protocols to be used for the geriatric population. There were some guidelines that EAST had put out and looked at about base excess and lactate levels for the treatment of shock, but they really didn't address the geriatric population. So that is why they went ahead and developed this protocol um, and then implemented it. So their hypothesis was lactate-guided therapy with early trauma surgeon involvement would be associated with lower mortality, particularly for individuals with recognized um, occult hypoperfusion. Um, 
So the protocol is this. This is the revised protocol. What they did was they thought, hey, I need to be able to have some kind of serial lactate levels. And so they decided in this that they would put those serial lactate levels into play and um, have specific times to go ahead and draw those lactate levels. This was a prospective cohort study. It looked at 65 and older. They had to be hemodynamically stable and have blunt trauma. Well, that's half our patients that we see, ground level falls, um, little old ladies, little old men, wheelchairs, what have you. They got an N of 2000, and this N looked at from pre to the first protocol implementation and then to the second uh, protocol implementation. The exclusions were that they weren't hemodynamically stable, that they um, didn't have penetrating trauma, and to me this was a duh, that they died um, in, the, in the ED or that they were DOA, um, so I really don't know how you could have really looked at them. But measurements really were, primary was um, in hospital mortality and then looking at occult hypo um, perfusion. And they used the number of 2.5 as their hypoperfusion, as opposed to the four that um, we kind of look at for our lactate levels. Again, 2000 fit the, fell, uh, fit the criteria. Their overall mortality was 3.9%, which um, was amazing. When you see some of the numbers that they had um, before, they started off at like 7.6, I think. There was no significant differences in mortality due to age, their comorbidities, their liver disease, and the um, normal mechanism of, um, of trauma for this geriatric population of falls. Those with occult hypotension showed a significant decrease in mortality over time um, when this protocol was implemented. And this is just to kind of show you some of the um, demographics, but on the bottom um, you can see that they went from 7.2, where is this? They went from 7.2 to, um, I can't do that, 3.5. So again, it was a significant difference um, in, their, um, in the way that they saw their patients. And then the other piece to it is, this is showing you from the time of the implementation of the protocol to um, 2001, how the significant and decrease that they had. So the conclusion was, is that older um, adults respond to trauma differently because of comorbidity conditions, polypharmacy, and inadequate cardiovascular responses to trauma. So just remember that, you know, when we're doing this piece that don't feel good about your trauma patient being that 120 over 90 because they're probably hypotensive at that point in time. Their early identification and treatment for these people um, using some kind of objective marker and for us um, in this study was the lactate of the 2.5 really is going to be the um, important part. And using some kind of high risk geriatric protocol is, is so very important um, for us in the trauma field to be able to take care of our patients in the trauma bay and to be able to resuscitate them well. So uh, really, this protocol was put together to heighten awareness to, um, to this population. So the bottom line is admission, um, venous lactates, and serolactate measures should be used to quickly identify the um, um, occult hypotension and then guide early resuscitation and early trauma surgeon involvement with these adults. All right, moving on. This, um, you know, using... Um, Intercostal nerve blocks has become one of the things Dr. Cornejo that I work with has become the champion in this. She and Dr. Hu love to go plate, but when, we can't, when they can't plate these patients, then they'll at least be able to put in an on -cue pump and put um, some nerve blocks. And Dr. Mangum, um, I didn't notice it when I pulled the article, but this is also dedicated to you, I guess, because Dr. Mangum was one of the um, authors of this study. So what we were looking at was the use of continuous nerve blocks for rib fractures and really to see how we could take care, better care of our patients. The objective of the study was to examine the experience with the use of the continuous nerve blocks. You know, there was really before this, there was really little data that had been pub published. And so their hypothesis was that if you put these continuous nerve blocks in, would they provide excellent analgesia, improve pulmonary function, and decrease length of stay? Now, if you've ever had a rib fracture, you know how much they hurt. Well, these weren't for just one rib fracture. These were for multiple rib fractures. These were also um, for those people that couldn't be plated. Um, 
meaning that they had they were maybe posterior or something else that um, they weren't able to be plated. You know, fr fractures, rib fractures are really common, um, blunt and um, chest injuries that we see. 10% of the blunt trauma admissions account for a significant morbidity and mortality, especially in the geriatric population. Trying to get those people to take those deep breaths, it hurts like heck to take that deep breath. And yes, I know that people tell me that the incentive spirometers don't really help, but you know, I think that they really do because what they'll do is make those people take those deep breaths. It makes them have some reason to do it. Um, and it really, it really helps decrease uh, mortality for some of these patients. You know, we know enough that they're not taking those deep breaths, they're ending up with atelectasis and effusion, and then it makes a little bit more work for me. And again, pain is really gonna make them um, have poor inspiration. So the inclusion here was 18 years or older, um, three or more unilateral rib fractures. The exclusion was that they were intubated, they had an allergy to local anesthesia, especially lidocaine derivatives. Um, received alternative analgesia, and then their inability to um, give informed consent. So what they did was the catheters were placed at the bedside um, with a paravertebral location, and then they used ropivacaine um, to be infused. And if you've ever seen an on cue pump, it really has this nice little thin catheter that's um, with a trocar, we go ahead and insert it up, up, the back of the, up their back, and then we'll leave it in place. Um, usually we leave it in place right now for five days. They left it in place um, up to 122 hours, so it was probably about the same piece. Respiratory rate they looked at, they looked at pain pre and post pain levels, they looked at maximal inspiration, and then the other thing that they looked at was really their maximal inspiration with um, coughing. And these are some of the I, to me, I really like being able to see things a little bit better. And what this graph is showing you, that if you look at pain, their pain levels had come down significantly. Look at where we were at like seven and a half and they came down to two and a half. How, how many of you can say that half your patients are gonna come down three quarters of the way for their pain? So again, this was not using any other kind of analgesia. This was just using the um, on cue pump. Again, the pain with a cough, it, it really was, came down three quarters of the way. So 75% reduction. Again, maximal inspiration. Um, after they put the block in, they were able to take those deep breaths and so they were able to decrease their amount of atelectasis and effusion that they would have. And then again, my length of stay um, was pretty much cut in half. So again, the catheters um, on average were there for about 122 hours. Most of them were placed within the first 24 hours of admission. 75% um, were within the first 12 hours. And that's a really important part to really good, get good pain control with your patients. 80 percent of these patients were discharged home. You know, it's really simple for uh, people to understand how to pull the catheter. It, it's not rocket science. It's, it's easier than pulling an IV out. So teaching them how to pull the um, catheter out was, um, and how to maintain the catheter while they were at home. 51% had um, pneumothoraxes um, and that needed a chest tube on um, their admission, and 31% had flail chest, but no other pain medications um, were used. So conclusions here were that previous therapies, you know, each have significant advantages, but combining this with some of our analgesias really gives you positive attributes to taking care of these patients. And the biggest one was this demonstrated excellent analgesia. It improved the pulmonary um, function of this patient and it really decreased the length of stay. This is, um, this is one of the topics that we were just discussing at our last um, meeting, and um, Dr. Fillmore is our newest um, attending, and Dr. Fillmore is so into taking care of soft tissue injuries. Um, he's become the boy to, um, to take care of them. So, um, and with soft tissue injuries, we, you know, we talk about compartment um, syndrome with our tibial um, um, tib-fib fractures, but we also have to talk about tibial plateau fractures and the amount of soft tissue injury. Now this is not a review, this is a review article. It is not a research project, but what it really did was, that to me was really go through some of the basics that we need to remember when we're taking care of these patients. 
There was effective ma management, knowing that we have effective management of soft tissue injuries really were with these isolated tip fib fractures will give us favorable outcomes if we take good care of them. The article highlighted the unique aspects of soft tissue um, coverings of the proximal tibia and how commonly um, they were commonly injured, um, the increased risk of complications following in, and then again, some of the things that we could do to avoid any additional injuries. Well, when they looked at it, they first looked at what the, were the mechanism of injuries. First, they looked at direct versus indirect. So the direct was really the um, pedestrian hit, being hit by the car, getting hit in the um, knees, and then um, sustaining this tibial plateau fracture. A lot of energy had to be absorbed during that period of time. It really, because of all that energy and causing it to get a tibial plateau um, injury, you had to think about all the energy that was expanded to, um, excuse me, to the tissue around it. The other indirect one was axle loading, and again, there was, this was another high energy piece. The common pathways were the soft tissue, edema, and then the inflammatory responses that were going on. This led to um, some venous compromise that led to some hypoxia, and then it led to some additional um, tissue injury. Again, the biggest thing was that with all that, you may end up getting some blistering, you may get some untreated tissue that's underneath um, that you're really not paying attention to. And really, the, the bottom line here was saying that prevention is going to be key. So the, some of the prevention was some of the basic things that we did. And I, I tell the nurses on the floor, I don't have to give you an order to put ice on this patient's wound. I don't have to give you an order to elevate it. Those should be basic nursing concepts that we look at. And th that was one of the things that they talked about um, to decrease inflammation. The other thing was, and we talked about this in our meeting too, is look under the padding. If the orthopod's not looking under it, it's, it should be our responsibility to do a good job to take care of these patients. And the other part is, is that, you know, this is all circumferential dressing. So if we're getting some edema underneath there, we got to think about that it's going to cause compartment issues. Really, the solution to pollution is dilution. I know I use this in um, renal pieces, but also we've got to do a good job of irrigating and debriding these wounds um, when they go to the, when they're in the emergency department, when they go to the OR, and then when they go back to the OR for their um, ORIF. So again, that's going to be important. Fracture blisters. It's a little bit different than Dr. Moulton talked about. Um, what they talked about were that they want to keep the integrity of those blisters. They didn't talk about um, aspirating them. They just talked about keeping the integrity of them, and then if they were disrupted, then we unroof them and then put a little bit of xeriform gauze on top of it. Interoperative management, I think this is the one that patients get really upset about because they want to go to the OR, they've got an X-fix on, they want to be able to get out of the hospital, and really choosing the right time to do it um, is important. So they talked about seven to ten days would be the best time for good recovery. And then the last piece is just reminding you that, you know, avoidance of any restrictive dressing, making sure that you use um, SCDs. And they talked about SCDs or just putting um, our foot pumps on them to help increase um, venous return. So summary was so significant soft tissue injuries generally accompany high injury tibial plateau fractures, and we need to really aggressively kind of take care of them. So last one. This is an older article. Um, this was done in, um, at the University of Bern in Switzerland. But I love this article because it reminds me of what happens with our patients. Because at least at our facility, our patients love each other in all different ways. They may use a baseball bat. They may use a tire iron. But they haven't read this article to teach them, really, the difference between a full bottle and an empty bottle. So how many of you think that the full bottle of beer is going to cause more damage than the empty bottle? Who thinks the empty bottle is going to do it? Who has no idea? OK, I'm going to let you go out and get a bottle of beer and then t with your friends um, figure it out. But somebody did this study. And they looked at um, you know, beer bottles you know, that when they break, yes, you can have penetrating trauma. But they also tested fracture patterns and looked at them. What they did were to, they took 10, six empty and four full, and dropped a steel ball, um, ball to see how, um, how they would break and which was their threshold. 
The result was empty withstood about 10 joules more than the full bottle before it broke. And the beer, um, because the beer is this carbonated beverage, it really puts a strain on the bottle and the, and the beer that's inside. So the conclusion was that the empty bottle of beers are sturdier than the full ones, and in theory, both can fracture the cranium. But really, if you're gonna use that half liter of beer, you know, drink it first, and then go ahead and hit your friends with it.